Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 22nd of January. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast coming to you from Adi Lang's news centre in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. After receiving reports of suspected H5N8 bird flu outside of confirmed infection areas, authorities will now cull ducks within a three kilometer radius of infected farms. On the eve of her opening speech at this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, President Park discusses boosting cooperation in the up and coming Internet of Everything industry with the head of US network firm Cisco. She also promotes her vision for a creative economy. Plus, as anti government protests intensify ahead of next month's election, the Thai government issues a 60 day state of emergency in an attempt to quell violence in Bangkok and its surrounding provinces. We start with the latest on the bird flu crisis here in Korea. Around 300,000 ducks and chickens have been culled so far, all in Korea's southern Jolabukdo province. Quarantine officials have been working around the clock and have reinforced stricter measures to try and contain the highly pathogenic strain. Connie Lee starts us off. The quarantine measures have been taken up a notch. Three days have passed since the first confirmed case of the highly pathogenic H5N8 bird flu strain was found here in southern Korea. The infected farms are blocked off like this. This means no one can come in and no one can get out. And it doesn't appear as though the quarantine measures will be eased anytime soon. <laughs> Here in Chalabukdo province, about 300 kilometers south of Seoul, every vehicle entering and exiting the area is sterilized. As of Tuesday, four duck farms have been confirmed as having been affected by the H5N8 virus, two in Kochangun and two in Puangun. But with a new suspected case emerging on Tuesday, the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has now ordered that ducks within a three-kilometer radius of an infected farm be slaughtered as a preventive measure. This has been expanded from the previous 500-meter radius. But the farmers aren't the only ones affected by the latest case of avian influenza. None of the customers are asking for the duck and chicken dishes, even though I explained to them that cooked meat is fine. This restaurant has seen its number of customers cut in half since the AI outbreak. This time is worse than the last bird flu scare we had. My restaurant was affected last time, but this time, because the virus was found in my neighborhood, less people are coming to eat here. Korea has had four bird flu outbreaks since 2003. The last time was in 2011, when over six million birds were killed. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, from one crisis affecting the nation to another, namely the worst data leak in Korea's history. The financial institutions in question are having a tough time placating an endless stream of angry customers who are quite rightly worried that their personal information may have fallen into unscrupulous hands. The government says it will unveil measures on Wednesday afternoon to prevent such a massive breach from happening again. Jim Young Gil reports. Thousands of angry customers swarmed into their banks for a second straight day on Tuesday to get their credit card details changed and to file complaints about the credit card firm's mismanagement of their personal information. Their actions follow in the wake of what has become one of the biggest information leaks in the nation's history, with up to 20 million people in Korea having been affected. I've been waiting here for more than an hour, and I'm dumbfounded by the whole situation. Financial institutions are responsible for protecting our assets and personal information, not leaking it. They should compensate for any damages that customers may incur. Concerns arising that customers' information may have fallen into the hands of scammers, with reports emerging that suspicious and unintended financial transactions have been made on accounts. 
The leak is one of the worst in the country's history. With the personal data, bank account details, addresses and credit ratings of millions of people now out in the open. The three card firms, KB Kumin Card, NH Nongyap Card and Lotte Card, said they will fully cover any financial losses suffered by their customers from scams linked to the data leak. On Wednesday, the government will announce a set of preventive measures to stop similar data leaks from occurring, as well as toughened penalties for those involved in leaking data. These are expected to include stronger monitoring of staff at financial companies involved in customer data management. Tougher regulations to prevent financial firms from sharing client data with their affiliates and stronger punitive measures on financial institutions and their executives in case of data leaks. This information leak comes less than one month after the personal data of some 130,000 Standard Chartered Bank Korea and Citibank Korea customers was stolen. Kim young Arirang News. And that government announcement will be made at 2 p.m. Korea time. Now, visiting U.S. Deputy Secretary of State William Burns has warned South Korean officials that North Korea's recent peace offensive could, in fact, be an early indicator of provocations to come. Hwang Sang-hee reports. North Korea has seemingly been on a peace offensive in the new year. But visiting U.S. Deputy Secretary of State William Burns says... The regime's tendency to have a sudden change of heart worries Washington. Well, I think uh, the United States and our friends uh, here in the Republic of Korea share a lot of concern about the recent behavior of the DPRK leadership and the, uh, the dangers of further reckless behavior and provocation in the future, as I said. There was a dramatic change in Pyongyang's attitude towards Seoul after North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's once powerful uncle, Chang sung tae was executed late last year. Following its proposal last week to end all cross-border slandering, Pyongyang has persistently expressed a strong will to improve inter-Korean ties. South Korea scoffed at the offer, with President Park Geun-hye telling the government to remain vigilant as the North engages in its propaganda offensive. After a meeting with South Korea's first vice foreign minister Kim Yoo-hyun in Seoul on Tuesday, Burns reaffirmed Washington's commitment to its ally. I express once again the strong American support for President Park's principled approach to the DPRK and stressed once again the strong American support for the defense and security of the Republic of Korea. And I would... The U.S. diplomat is expected to discuss the current state of North Korea with officials in China before moving on to Japan, where the country's denials of historical wrongdoings will be taken up. Once Burns wraps up his trip, U.S. Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Russell, who will accompany Burns in China and Japan, will visit Seoul on Sunday to share the results of the discussions in Beijing and Tokyo. Hwang sang Arirang News. Staying with North Korea's peace offensive, South Korea's unification minister has dismissed Pyongyang's proposal to end all cross-border hostilities and provocations, saying the offer doesn't make any sense. Speaking at a forum on Tuesday, Ryu Kil-jae said North Korea made the proposal last week, knowing full well that South Korea could not and would not accept it. Instead, the minister called for the resumption of reunions for families separated since the Korean War which Pyongyang had unilaterally called off at the last minute in September last year. The Korean trade official who was kidnapped in the Libyan capital of Tripoli over the weekend is safe, according to an official from Korea's foreign ministry. Han sok the head of the local branch of the state-run Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency, or COTRA, was abducted by four armed men on his way home from work on Sunday evening local time. Citing a source with information about the incident, Seoul-based Yonap News Agency reports the kidnappers are members of a small militia group and the Libyan government and the militia are secretly negotiating a ransom payment. Other Korean media say the government asked for around 2 million US dollars, something the foreign ministry here in Korea denies. The ministry says the government would never expose information about the kidnappers or a potential ransom for the sake of the abductees' safety. 
President Park Geun-hye is in Davos for this year's World Economic Forum. Ahead of the forum's official opening, President Park spent the day meeting with business leaders from around the world to urge them to invest more in Korea. Our presidential correspondent, Oh jun -ju, who is traveling with the president, has the details. Promoting Korea to the world's business leaders was the name of the game for President Park on the eve of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Taking part in Korea Night, an event dedicated to showcasing Korean culture and technology, which has been held in Davos for six straight years now, President Park called on the world's most powerful executives to look for investment opportunities in Korea's so-called creative economy. She promised to ease regulations on investment, except for ones that are truly necessary, to foster a better environment for foreign businesses. Among the global figures attending the event were Lloyd's chairman John Nelson and Jacob Frankel, chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase International. President Beck also met with Cisco CEO John Chambers. I wanted to meet you for a year now. Thank you for giving us the time. And discussed ways to cooperate in the sector of Internet of Everything. Internet of Everything is a rising industry that aims at connecting objects in homes, offices, cars, and elsewhere to the Internet so they automatically adjust to people's needs and preferences. President Park asked Cisco to actively invest in Korea and closely work with Korean firms to help the nation realize her vision of a creative economy. Chambers said Cisco's joint project with the British government to develop the European country's high-tech industry is very similar to President Park's vision. He then said he would be very happy to expand cooperation with Korean institutions and companies in the sector. President Beck will be making an opening speech on the creative economy and entrepreneurship in the first session of this year's World Economic Forum on Wednesday. She will also pitch Korea's qualities to the CEOs of global companies like Qualcomm, Aramco and Siemens. Oh jun Arirang News, Bern. The International Monetary Fund has upwardly revised its growth forecast for the world economy this year to 3.7 percent. Ah Huang Jie also tells us what the IMF expects from the U.S. Federal Reserve's stimulus tapering. In its updated World Economic Outlook on Tuesday, the International Monetary Fund revised its outlook for this year to 3.7 percent, up 0.1 percentage points from its earlier forecast. The fund expects the world economy to expand 3.9% in 2015. The IMF said the upward revision comes largely on the economic recovery in advanced nations, which is also leading a rebound in exports in emerging economies. That is reflected in the IMF forecast, which revised up its growth outlook for the U.S. in 2014 to 2.8% and the Eurozone economies to 1%. The Korean economy is also expected to pick up this year on strong external demands. The global economic recovery will lead to expanded exports of Korean products that will eventually lead to a recovery in the domestic economy. The IMF, however, cited weak domestic demand in emerging nations as remaining concerns. It went on to say that domestic weakness combined with capital outflows prompted by the U.S. Federal Reserve's bomb buying stimulus tapering could result in sharper capital outflows and exchange rate adjustments. The Korean government has pledged to focus this year's economic policies on boosting domestic demand to create more jobs and achieve a balanced economy. The IMF's forecast on the Korean economy is expected to be released around February or April. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea's venture investments reached a record high last year, rising more than 12 percent compared to a year earlier. The Small and Medium Business Administration and the Korean Venture Capital Association announced on Tuesday that investments in ventures reached 1.4 trillion won, or roughly 1.7 billion U.S. dollars, in 2013. 
That is the highest level since 2001. Officials attribute the rise to the Park and Hay administration's drive to push for more efficient framework for startups. In international news and in the face of growing violence, the Thai government has declared a 60-day state of emergency in Bangkok and its surrounding provinces starting this Wednesday. The move announced on Tuesday allows for curfews to be imposed, for suspects to be held without charges and for the banning of political gatherings. Anti-government protesters have blocked up parts of Bangkok in an attempt to get Prime Minister Ingluck Shinawat to step down and the rallies have turned more violent in recent days. Since the protests began in November, nine people have died and hundreds more have been injured. Syria stands accused of systematic killings and torture on a truly horrific scale. Not the best atmosphere to begin international peace talks on ending the brutal conflict. A report detailing the atrocities was released on Tuesday as delegations began arriving. In Switzerland, Park ji reports. The new report reveals the Syrian government's systematic use of execution and torture. A team of former international war crimes prosecutors released their findings and info photo evidence to back their claim that the Assad regime tortured and killed about 11,000 detainees. We came to the conclusion that the uh, killings were of an industrial kind, such that uh, the evidence we found would certainly underpin any kind of uh, a, a crime at international law. The photos were taken by a formal Syrian military police officer who has since defected and fled the country. The pictures were reminiscent of the worst pictures that came out of Belsen and Auschwitz after the Second World War. And these poor creatures were not just starved, but they were also tortured whilst they were starving. Reacting to the report, the U.S. State Department condemned Syria in the strongest possible terms, saying the photos show apparent actions that would be serious international crimes. Britain's Foreign Secretary also expressed shock and horror at seeing the report. I've seen a lot of this evidence. It is uh, compelling and horrific. Um, and it is important that those who have perpetrated these crimes are one day held to account. Meanwhile, the world's leading human rights advocacy group has slammed the international community for not doing enough to end the atrocities being committed in Syria. In its annual report released on Tuesday, Human Rights Watch said world powers have focused too much on bringing President Bashar al-Assad and his government to the negotiating table and put aside humanitarian matters such as the protection of civilians. What I hope the people gathered in Geneva will do is not simply to try to work out a long-term peace deal, but in the interim to put pressure on the Syrian government to stop targeting civilians, to stop deliberately depriving civilians of humanitarian aid. The group also criticized Syria's close allies, Russia and China, for turning a blind eye to the humanitarian crisis in the country. Park ji Arirang News. Looking to crush terrorist threats to the Sochi Olympics before they get off the ground, Russian police have killed a senior Islamist militant in Russia's North Caucasus region. The country's anti-terror committee says Eldar Magatov, a suspect in attacks on Russian targets and alleged leader of an insurgent group in Dagestan, died Tuesday in a shootout with police. Security forces are also scouring Sochi for a so-called Black Widow terrorist who may have arrived in the Olympic host city early this month to organize an attack before or during the Games. The Islamist militant group behind two suicide bombings in the southern city of Volgograd last month has warned of more attacks if the Olympics go ahead in Sochi. And in a move that is almost certain to throw fuel on China's territorial disputes with its neighbors, Beijing plans to build, to base rather, a huge civilian patrol ship on one of the main islands it controls in the disputed South China Sea and begin regular patrols. The China Ocean News, published by the State Oceanic Administration, says the ship would be based on Woody Island, which China calls Sansha City on the Paracel Islands. 
The report says the regular patrol will serve to protect China's maritime interests, but didn't say when they will begin. China claims virtually the entire South China Sea, putting it at odds with several countries in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines and Vietnam. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off in the KBO. Now, one of the biggest controversies of last season were all the blown calls by the umpires. And now the league is looking to implement a new video replay system that will change all that. Now, following the footsteps of Major League Baseball, who will begin using this new video replay system that includes 12 different cameras being added around the stadiums, the KBO hopes to do just that by 2015. By utilizing such system, the umpires can take a look at 13 different close calls at any given moment. And staying with baseball, while Japan has the Tokyo Dome and the U.S. has the Tropicana Field, Korea doesn't have a dome stadium just yet. And with the nation's first dome stadium completing its construction next year in Seoul, they're still looking for a team to bring in. And while the LG Twins and the Tucson Bears will most likely stay in Chamshir Stadium, the Nexon Heroes are the likely suitors for the new stadium. And according to the officials in charge of the new stadium, they'll finalize everything by the first half of this season and begin playing in the stadium by 2015. More baseball this time in Major League Baseball, where Im Chang Young just might be able to return to the majors. After being released as a non tender, the 38 year old reliever was invited by the same team that released him, as the Chicago Cubs invited him to the spring camp. And while chances are still slim that he'll earn a spot on the roster, the former Samsung Lion continues to work out this offseason, hoping for a second chance. And shifting gears and over to hockey, where the Korean national hockey team will soon add two more Canadians onto their squad. Now, two Canadian forwards, Brian Young and Michael Swift, is in the process of receiving their Korean citizenship in hopes to join the national team. While the papers are still being processed, it's likely that they'll become the second and third Canadians to become naturalized Korean citizens since Brock Radunsky became a Korean last year. And finishing things off with some Tuesday night KBL action as the Ursan Mobis Phoebus took on the Changwon LG Sakers. And jumping right into the action here, the LG Sakers off to a great start, take a comfortable 18 12 lead after the first quarter before Mobis cuts the deficit to 36 31 going into halftime. But in the third quarter, LG continues to run away with the game until Mobis starts rallying big in the fourth quarter, including this one, Pak Gu Young. Draining a three with 11 seconds left to tie the game 67 67. But Davon Jefferson, who had a monster game, sinks the game winner as time expires as LG takes the thriller 69 67, with Davon Jefferson finishing off with 32 points. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
And time now to check in on the weather conditions in Korea and around the world. And that's all for now. Thanks ever so much for joining us. We'll be back at noon Korea time. But in the meantime, you can always catch up with what's been happening on our website, which can be found at arirang.co.kr forward slash news.